Hello, my little people. So I thought it would be fun if we read a book together. I know we don't, don't get to see each other as much as we would like to, or even close to as much as we would like to. I don't need my glasses right now. Um, so I thought it would be fun if we start reading a book together. So I thought I will record a chapter per time. And then when you get a chance, you can listen to it if you want to. So I thought we would do one that I read to the boys when they were little, not little, they were younger. And it was one of those books that made me get super excited and the boys get super excited and we didn't want it to end. We might've frozen up just then because I was opening up my screen so that it would work well. Anyways, it was exciting. It's set in World War II. It has um, like mystery and it has like all kinds of excitement. And I cried. Just going to tell you ahead of time. There are some scenes in the book, like some parts of it where it gets, and it's intense at times. So I'm just going to tell you. So it's called The Winged Watchman by Hilda Van Stockham. And I'm going to show you, I don't know if it'll show up because of the reflection, but I'm going to try to get it close enough where you can see. There you go. If you see the picture. Okay, so the setting is World War II. And it is set in Holland. And um, it's dedicated to St. Victor, the patron saint of Mills, and to the author's cousin. So and then she gives like a list of people she's really thankful to that helped her write the book that gave her stories. So the thing to remember is like, even though this is fiction, it's historical fiction. So it takes things that were really happening, people that were really going through things um, that what's going on is really what was going on. But what it does is it takes fiction and that it creates a couple of characters that lets you come into the story into the way it was in history and lets you learn about that through kind of a story instead of just somebody saying, so on such and such a day and such and such a time, there was such and such a thing going on. So it's kind of a cool thing that you can read historical fiction. But you have to be careful, just like with even non-historical fiction like history and with um, uh, things like uh, biographies and autobiographies and things like that even if someone says this is this is a true story always remember you need to kind of hold it up to that lens of what do we know the facts are because no matter what's written it brings people and people have emotions and thoughts and feelings and so no matter what's happening they're going to kind of remember it their way or they're going to think of it kind of with their ideas. So just always remember that when you're reading a book that don't just take it as fact, always hold it up and go, what do I know is true about this? And does this match up with real? So here we go. Chapter one, I gotta get to chapter one. It took a long time to say it. Okay, so chapter one is called Freya and there's a map I'm gonna show you guys. Let's see if I can zoom in on it. It's like a little map of the town where this is going on. Do you guys hear Uncle Greg singing in the background? You probably will hear some noises in the background because Uncle Greg is going to make noise, but that's okay. And Coco. So here we go. Chapter one, if I can get to it. Well, it's not letting me get to it. We shall see if it will let me get to it. And I will be right back. I'm going to figure Okay, I figured it out. It had opened in a different window. Weird. Okay, are you guys ready? Chapter one is called Freya. Joris Vergham was six years old when the Germans invaded Holland. At 10, he could remember little of what it had been like before the war. Dirk John, his brother, who was four years older, could tell him more about it, but Joris suspected that he made things up. Surely there could never have been a time when people threw away potato parings and apple cores and fed their precious sugar beets to the pigs. But Dirk John said it was all true and you did not have to walk to the farms to get your food either. People actually brought it to the door and shops had shelves bulging with merchandise. The most marvelous stuff, Dirk said. Dirk, 
for St. Nicholas, there were animals made of sugar and great big spiced cakes and chocolate letters. What does chocolate taste like? Asked Joris. But Dirk Jan didn't know how to explain the taste. Toys too, he said, and clothes. You didn't need ration coupons and you could buy anything you wanted. And the shopkeeper bowed and said, thank you as you asked and came and they asked you to come again. That made Joris laugh. Imagine Mrs. Jansen of the bare little grocery store in the village saying, thank you. She usually started to scream, I'm all sold out before you could slip off your clogs and enter the store. I don't believe it. But Dirk Jan nodded. No, when I made my first communion, he said mother bought me new underclothes and a whole new suit. And Mr. Solomon, who had the clothing store before the Germans took him, he kept smiling and showing her more. A whole new suit, whispered Joris enviously. Hmm. For his own first communion, mother had made him a new shirt out of an old sheet and had knitted stockings for him out of a black sweater of hers. He had been very proud of himself too, but a whole suit? You could not get that now, even if you saved your rations for years and years, he thought. You'll see. Once the war is over, those times will come back again, promised Dirk Jan. Joris wondered. He could not even imagine what it would be like when the war was over. He'd gotten so used to the drone, the regular drone of English bombers on their way to Berlin and to the exploding shells of anti-aircraft guns. He'd gotten used to the feeling of danger, always threatening. These things were part of his life, like hail and thunder, but he did not like them. He hated any kind of strife. He'd walk a long way around not to pass two women shouting at each other across the street, and he seldom took part in school quarrels. Yet. Once he started a fight himself, it was early in the summer vacation of 1944 and Joris was on his way to the village on an errand for his mother. He was crossing the highway when he saw two boys wearing threadbare city clothes and patched leather shoes. They had hitched a collie puppy no more than three months old to a homemade cart. One of the boys knelt in the cart and shouted to the pup to pull him up. The pup tried hard, tongue out, eyes popping. It pulled the cart for a few paces and then sat down whimpering. It looked around with pleading eyes, thumping its tail. Go on, stupid mutt, the boy cried. And one in, the one in the cart began to hit the pup over the head with a stick. Joris never could remember afterwards exactly what happened. He only knew that he flew into a wild fury and charged at those boys head down. It was two against one, but perhaps his head was harder than most, or perhaps anger, perhaps anger, perhaps the anger had given him extra strength, unusual strength. His wooden shoes were also excellent weapons, which the boys could not match. At any rate, he chased them off long enough to be able to unhitch the pup. He grabbed the furry squirming animal in his arms and he ran for the boys had recovered from their surprise and they were after him. They threw stones at him. One hit his head and he staggered for a moment, but he kept running. Thief, the boys shouted, give us back our pup. But their voices grew fainter. The stones stopped falling and after a while, George slackened his speed. His head throbbed and his nose bled. He wiped it with the sleeve and shifted the heavy pup who was licking his ear. It was, quite, it was quiet on the dike road between the lush green fields of the diked in polders. In the distance loomed the thatched body and whirling wings of the watchman, his father's windmill. Do you guys remember what the name of the book is? The Winged Watchman? His mother gasped when she saw him come in. He had a big lump on his head where the stone had hit him. One eye was black and his clothes were spattered with blood. What happened? She cried. Don't tell me you've been fighting. I had to rescue this pup, said Joris, putting it on the floor where it started to sniff around curiously. Oh, merciful Saint Joseph, cried his mother. And what about my message? Oh, the buttons. I forgot, stammered Joris. Well, 
you will you will have to wait for your new jacket then said mother never mind come to the pump and i'll clean you up oh you poor child she bustled about tending his war her wounded warrior while she listened to his tale Many's the time I had to do this for Dirk Jan, she said, placing a cold wet cloth on Joris's swollen eye. I never thought I'd have to do it for you. Still, you did the right thing to defend a helpless creature, but you'll have to find out where it belongs and bring it back. Mother, cried Joris in anguish, I can't bring it back. Those boys will kill it. When mother insisted, he began to sob wildly. Mother felt sorry for him. We'll ask father, she said. The Vierhagen family discussed the pup during supper. Three-year-old Trixie, a tiny child with a head full of red curls, sat in her high chair rubbing spinach all over her face. Mother told father what had happened when Joris stared at his plate. He was praying inside, dear God, please let me keep the pup. I'll never do anything wrong again. I promise, I promise, please God. I know where the pup belongs, said Dirk Jan. It's the DeWitt's pup. Hans and Hobble DeWitt showed it to me. They're from Amsterdam and they're staying at the Schneiderhausen's farm for the summer. I never thought Joris would dare take on anyone that big. Yes, it's quite a feat for our Joris, said father. When he smiled, little lines ran from the corners of his eyes in all directions like rays of the sun. Father's face was broad and strong and peaceful. Well, Joris, he said, if I try to get this pup for you, will you pay me back in chores? Oh, yes, father, yes. I'll weed the garden, I'll chop the wood, I'll mine Trixie, I'll do anything. Joris was stammering with happiness. After dinner, father, Dirk Jan and Joris went together to the Schneiderhausen's farm. Joris carried the pup. Off he goes through the woods. It was wonderful to be out with father. It did not happen often for he was a very busy man. He was responsible for keeping the Rheinsauter polder dry. Each polder, a piece of reclaimed land, has its own mill to pump away the excess water that gathers between the dikes. When the mill wasn't working, father was fishing or helping on a farm. Farmer Schneiderhans lived in the Nordarar, get that, the Nordarar holder. Father and the boys took the short way along the broad brain of the drainage canal, which cupped between two dikes, as it was much higher than the fields on either side. Cattle grazed below them, swishing their tails at dancing midges. Frogs were croaking in the ditches and birds were twittering in the willow trees that lined the road. The Norderar polder was a large one. It had two windmills. One, the far one at the other end of the polder, had been pulled down and replaced by an electric pump. This did the work of two, and the other windmill, the giant, stood wingless and idle. Father and the boys passed it on the way to the Schneiderhans farm. Joris felt sorry for it, and father seemed sad too. It's a shame to let the mill go, he said. Who knows when it might be needed? Too many windmills are scrapped in Holland. There are fewer and fewer boys now who want to be millwrights. After a while, we won't know how to build windmills anymore. I want to be a millwright, father, cried Dirk John. Father nodded, I know, son, and I'm glad. But we need more than one to keep our windmills in repair. The trouble is that people think electricity is foolproof and easy. It certainly does not require much skill to run an electric pump. What they forget is that you have no control over your power that way. You make yourself dependent on a supply which is generated miles away in some central spot. If, if that fails, you are helpless. And can we afford to be helpless when it may mean drowning? Father stared into the distance where the Sadarwad church spire lifted itself like an exclamation point out of the hazy blue of the trees. A dreadful thought came to Joris. They won't scrap the wind watchmen, will they? He asked. Father sighed. Hmm. There are never farmers in our polder who are envious of the modern Norderar pump. There are farmers in the polder who are envious. Not, not that they were. They imagine it is more efficient and costs less. 
There is talk of electrifying the mill after the war. But what will happen to us then, asked George. I suppose we'll have to look for another mill, said father. And leave our home, cried George. That wouldn't be fair, protested Dirk Jan. Grandfather and great-grandfather lived in our mill. It belongs to us. Not really, explained father. It belongs to the Rice Later Holder com Committee, and they will decide whether to keep it or scrap it. The boys were silent the rest of the way. They had never realized the danger that threatened their home. The Schneider Hans farm was as wealthy as a farm could be in occupied territory. The Germans wanted a large share of the waving wheat and the heavy cattle. At the same, all the same, Father Schneiderhans lived comfortably, Farmer Schneiderhans lived comfortably enough in his long rambling farmhouse with its thatched roof and small windows. Hay bulged high under a cap of stilts in the yard. Chickens scratched and clucked, pigs grunted in the shed. Nero, the Schneiderhans Alsatian, came bounding out of the house to greet the visitors. After him, Hendrik, the younger son of the farmer and the classmate of Joris. I know what you've come for, he shouted. You've come to bring back the pup. Hans and Havel said you stole it, but I told them I knew you'd be sure to bring it back. He sounded triumphant. Hans and Havel aren't here. They've gone fishing. Come, I'll show you the farm. I've got to gather the eggs for mother. He added, waving a basket. Joris shook his head and ran after father and Dirk John, who had already entered the house. The puppy hit its head under Joris's arm, hit its head under Joris's arm as if it were scared. Joris felt scared too. He tightened his clasp on the dog and entered the house timidly. The DeWitt parents were at home and so were Mr. and Mrs. Schneiderhans. They were all sitting in the dark parlor with its heavy lace curtains, stiff red plush chairs and flowered wallpaper. Mr. and Mrs. DeWitt did not seem pleased to see the pup. And they were amazed that it was Joris who had attacked their sons. You're sure it wasn't this one? They asked, pointing at Dirk John. But it was Joris who had the black eye, and that convinced them. Father apologized for Joris having taken the pup and offered to buy it. Mr. and Mrs. DeWitt looked at each other. Should we do this? As a matter of fact, Mr. DeWitt said, we don't want a dog. It's a nuisance in the city and we're hard put to feed ourselves, let alone animals. Mrs. DeWitt nodded with each word. She was a thin, nervous woman who looked underfed in spite of the good farm food she'd been getting. Oh, it's only because the boys begged for it that we bought the dog, Mrs. DeWitt, can, Mr. DeWitt continued, but they haven't been kind to it and I confess that I'll be relieved to sell it to you. So father got the pup for a few florins and Mrs. Schneiderhans, a thick-set, patient woman, served fresh-made buttermilk and real wheat cookies to seal the bargain. Joris and Dirk John were relishing every mouthful of this treat, Joris sharing his with the pup, and the grown-ups had started a polite conversation about the difficulties and scarcities of wartime. When a loud yelping outside startled them, the pup began to whimper and hid its head under Joris's arm again. Leendert, don't be mean. Nero wasn't doing anything. Stop it, they heard Hendrik cry. Keep him out of my way, then, came a gruff voice. That wretched dog. A moment later, a young man slouched into the room. His small eyes took in the company. There was no smile on his face, nor did he utter a word of welcome. He just looked, and everyone in the room became uncomfortable. Hello, Leendert, said Mrs. Schleiderhans with a forced cheerfulness. Do you want supper? Of course, said Leonard, his mouth twisting up a little as if he were trying to smile. But it was too much trouble for the rest of his face. He was still staring at the company. Mrs. DeWitt got up. Well, we'd better be going, we'd better be going to our own room now, Bertus, she said nervously to her husband. Mr. DeWitt got up too, but Mr. Schneiderhans interfered. Stay, he said. I won't have you chased away by my son's bad manners. The DeWitts sat down again awkwardly. Mr. Schneiderhans glared at Leendert. Can't you greet our guests properly, he asked. If you can't behave, you'd better go. Now a smile curved Leendert's mouth, a real smile that lit a triumphant green spark in his eyes. He stood a little straighter. 
You'd better mind how you talk to me, Pa, he said. I was made a land watcher today. Do you guys know what a land watcher was? Land watchers were detested Dutchmen who enforced the laws of the Nazi occupation. Mr. Sch Mr. Schnetterhans jumped up very red. He would have said something if Leendert had not thrown him an odd look through his pale lashes and added, I can have you arrested, Pa. You know, if I tell about your black market activities, Mr. Schneiderhans swallowed and stared and said nothing. A little muscle twitched at his cheek. Leendert laughed softly and stretched himself. Where's the food, mom? He asked insolently. His mother hurried to get it for him and he followed her to the kitchen. Mr. Schneiderhans sat down heavily. Father tried to console him. He's probably only boasting, he said. He doesn't mean it. Veins stood out on Mr. Schneiderhans' forehead. You mean it? Of course he means it, he growled. He's always was a good-for-nothing scamp. Eighteen he is, and he's never raised a finger to help me. But that he should become a traitor? Oh. The DeWitts made a sign to each other to leave. Father got up, too. The farmer hardly noticed when they all said goodbye. When father and the boy stepped outside, they saw Hendrick with his arms around his dog. What's the matter? Joris asked. Leander kicked him, Hendrick said, sniffing. He kicked him for nothing. Joris was glad he didn't have a brother like Leander. Father bought the puppy, said she's mine, and I'm going to call her Freya. Why Freya? asked Hendrick. Joris didn't know how to explain. He loved to read. It was always taking out books from the school library, especially fairy tales and sagas. Freya, the Norse goddess for whom Friday is named, was always had always been a favorite of his. He had pictured her white and gold, like the pup, but he did not think Hendrick would understand, so he just said, ah, because. You live in a windmill, don't you, asked Hendrick. Can I come and look at it sometime? Our giant doesn't work anymore. And anyway, I'm scared to go there. He let his voice drop into a mysterious whisper as he added, it's haunted. Honest, I saw ghosts there myself. Joris would have liked to question him further, but the others had gone on. Yeah, come on and see our mail then. And bring Nero, he shouted as he ran off. The sun had gone down and the mists were rising from the polders. Black bats fluttered drunkenly against the, last, against the last turquoise glimmer of the day. The ruined mill loomed large and sinister. Is it haunted? whispered Joris. Father squeezed his hand and laughed. It was true that every spring he repainted the white cross on the, white, the wall of the watchman, which was supposed to ward off evil. His father had done it, and his grandfather before him, but with ghosts. He did not hold. Good people need not fear ghosts, he said. It was past curfew and a German soldier or a land watcher who saw them might shoot. They walked cautiously, keeping in the shadow of the willow trees that lined the dike. Joris was glad when he saw the lighted window of the watch, windows of the watchman. Mother was there waiting to hear the news about the puppy. Joy flooded Joris's heart when he thought of it. He had longed so much for a dog of his own, and here she was, more lovely than he could have ever imagined. Freya. He kissed the pup between her ears. And that, my dear sweets, is the end of chapter one. <laughs>